Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Nature Center Folklore. What am I saying? Welcome to Nature Folklore. This is Nature Folklore Sessions of 25th of September, 2022. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining me at this latest time that we've ever done this on a Sunday. Uh, I've just uh, come back from a straw crafts um, kind of workshop and uh, some little bits that I've done here. <laughs> so, thanks for joining me. As I say, you've done these uh, love knots. And uh, I haven't done these since I was a child and in my teens. twenty. I think it was in my 20s. So that's a wee selection uh believe it or not there's different weaves very difficult to show in the green screen but that's uh kind of what i've just come from i've just flown in uh i uh from there i i've got a bit of a different setup in the studio so i hope it all works so this is going to be interesting and even the microphone is deciding no you're not going to cooperate okay there we go i'll tell you a little bit about uh, the love knots uh, in a minute so thank you for uh, joining me uh, it's our weekly time of exploring nature center folklore connecting this to your favorite sanctuary space and expressing inspired visions from your sanctuary through your poetry right arts, crafts, and performance, and problem solving. Now, this is the first of um, eight, eight nature folklore editions that's going to lead up to Sawan. And uh, there's a bit of a Sawan picture there for you. And uh, this is the first of three-part series, which is Cauldrons and Ale. And there's an old photograph. that I, That's the one that's behind me. And there I am back again. So... So brewing herbs, broomsticks, women, when we hear these words together, I think there's a quick assumption that uh, we're describing a witch. And there we go. And, uh, well, brewing Hubble bubble stuff, what are we thinking about there? Uh, that's what I'm going to be covering uh, this afternoon and all into the evening. And before I explain more, uh, there's no guest today. Uh, I'm going to have to send some personal invites out to return some of our guests to us very soon because I know they've got a lot of content to share with us uh, regarding the Sawan themes that are coming up, or Sawan, depending how you pronounce it. But as usual, these Nature Center Folklore um, sessions, I don't know why I'm talking about Nature Center Folklore now, but I suppose it is. Nature Folklore sessions, the videos, and also extra tree and water sanctuary support all brought to you thanks to our kind subscribers that are supporting us. And without them, I couldn't fund putting on this show to share with you today. So thank you for your help there. To subscribe to Nature Folklore, here's the main link. That's the Patreon link uh, there. And if you're not really keen on using the PayPal, which is the payment platform that Patreon use, you can always go to uh, buy me a coffee and I'll get the old banner up underneath. There you go. And you can use any old card for that one uh, uh, to make a donation, a subscription, whatever you like to do. So thanks very much. Helping out with a dollar, euro, pound or more a month. It goes such a long way to help keeping this afloat when there's several people helping out with that. So thanks very much. And I know some of you that are helping are watching already or be watching later on this afternoon or even later uh, for the through the archive so let's see which uh, early birds are with us for this lovely edition today let's see um, who's caught this new time that we're, i'm doing uh susan samuel is here which is lovely uh love from burton cheshire there she is and uh s uh, lee there is having the cauldron party uh which is lovely and lovely to see sherry here sherry murphy Hi to everyone from down East Maine. Um, lovely here today. Hurricane missed us. Yes, I've been hearing. I hope everyone's okay. Been hearing of hurricanes in the US and people uh, battering, um, you know, covering over and uh, bringing down the hatches and all that cautious stuff. So sorry you got that here. Certainly the warm weather has uh, gone away and uh, it's cloudy. There was a bit of drizzle early this afternoon. As I say, I went to a straw 
workshop and um we see um, i i i as I say I did these sort of love knot things, and the whole tradition with these is um, well, the way I was taught it as a child was uh, if you handed this at the various wooing times, um, especially after first harvest, uh, that's um, like the Bilberry Sunday traditions, the sort of meeting, and certainly getting serious at that time, although this moved to someone as well. But uh, if you there was someone you fancy and you offer them a love knot, if they put it in their hair or put it around their neck, they're uh, kind of tying the knot with you. And uh, But if they just put it as a uh, brooch, uh, saying, yeah, it's not very complimentary, glad to get your offer, but let's say as good friends. So it's for friendship if they put it on the chest, say, as a brooch. But if it goes in the hair or around the neck, you know that... Uh, you're on the way to tying the knot, which is what happens, obviously, uh, with um, the uh, hand fasting. You tie, uh, you put the, you do the tying of the knot with that, uh, with a, a piece of weaving or a ribbon, which is fantastic. And I've got a couple of pictures of some more advanced stuff. I know I'm off the subject, but I'll come on to the subject in a minute. But I thought this was nice. I mean, you just put this up because I've only just this minute come in. Um, and uh, let's get back to it. So that was some work by some people, uh, which is uh, lovely. And I, I think I've got another photograph as well, if I can get the photographs up again. And uh, this is uh, this lad here, he was really cracking on. Uh, there we go, very advanced stuff. And hopefully uh, I'll be that skilled soon. <laughs> but he was teaching us anyway. He's from the Country Life uh, Museum out near Castle Bar. So he was showing his experience. But this was actually hosted by Edwina Gluck, Gluck, Gluckian, a wonderful woman uh, famous for setting up the crossroad dances, teaching the dancers in Shino dancing, uh, making of straw hats and uh, straw boys, the mamas. She gets involved in a lot of those traditions. Doesn't live very far away from here. So that was a, a lovely time as such. Anyway, I'll get on with the show now and I'll let me introduce this because I know that's what you've really been dying to see. Um, so, did you know that beer, ale, uh, any of those beverages, beer or ale, is the third most consumed beverage in the world after water and tea? And there we go. A lot of craft beer is certainly being made these days, isn't it? And perhaps you saw what wine was, but uh, beer, ale, it's been an essential part of the human diet for at least 7,000 years, possibly as far as um, 10,000 years. There we go. And that's the way it used to be consumed. I'm going to talk a bit about that uh, in a moment as well. Um, but today, through this Nature Folklore edition, I intend to demonstrate how beer or ale brewing is really about the history of women. Much more than it is about the testosterone shooting matches of redneck men. Um, so even to illustrate how what became what we perhaps call witchery today, how that was seeded, and especially by the remarkable courage of ancient ale brewing women. And uh, there's some uh, there's one you might recognize. Uh, actually, I'm going to talk more about this uh, next week because that's obviously Bridget with her one of her cattle there. And she has a cauldron there. Well, I assume it's got ale. People tend to be familiar with Bridget with uh, poetry, healing, and metal craft. But there is that fourth one of ale. And I'm going to talk more about that next week. But that was a picture I brought up for uh, the courage of ancient ale brewing women now uh, rather than the love you know they were doing this uh, as i say the women the ale house women and uh, this was the origins to me rather than the uh, love peace and fairy dance flower power gathering women a bit like that or uh, those who may call themselves witches or even goddesses today something gathering up something like that now today's session was actually inspired by this lovely woman. The reason I did this, and she hasn't come up yet, but she will. There she is. Uh, um, 
G the late Jeannie Robertson, uh, I was inspired when I heard a song composed and sang by her. She's a Scottish traveler, uh, kind of around the Inverness area, east of Ross, uh, that area. And I don't know what she's been gathering there. But anyway, the song that she sang um, is, uh, well, I'll tell you where it's from. But it, what it was is... I went onto a discovery trail about the legacy of Ale House Wives after a song that she sang about the Ale House. And uh, this seems to have a very close connection to why the traveler communities of the day actually happened and how they become uh, travelers. Now, I heard uh, Gina's inspiring and somewhat lusty song on an album called Grit. And that's uh, the, on the album cover. That's actually on the Isle of Mull there, which is lovely. And it was put together by the uh, greatly missed, uh, amazing man, amazing creator and musician, Martin Bennett. Uh, in fact, when we were on Mull, we used to actually pick up bread from his mother. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think perhaps he might be my own most missing musician that has passed away. Um, and that picture there, yeah, I better talk about that because his music is amazingly kept alive by Martin's friend Greg Lawson and the Grit Orchestra. And I haven't been to a concert there yet, they don't perform that often, but that's one of my dreams. Most of the time, they're performing in Scotland somewhere, some big events around uh, England, but uh, they do a wonderful uh, cover of the Ale House as well. But sorry, I can't stream the Ale House um, track or the Grit Orchestra because they're really wrapped up with very tight copyright. So I try and do that. YouTube will have me banned for life. Anyway, I'll move on. Uh, the remarkable heritage and history of Ale House women. It's been constantly hijacked, I feel, by the gilded patriarchy cultures of uh, men, the, you know, the BS boy clubs type. Uh, do I have them here? No, that's the Grit Orchestra again. There we go, this sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> did the kind of hijacking through their guilds. And during part three of this series, I will um, discuss how and why men gilded together and spread the viral belief of the actual existence of witchery. Yes, it was kind of made up. Anyway, also why they successfully infested human minds with their belief of witchery, and, you know, infesting people's minds with this sort of imagery, why it was done. I'll talk about this on episode three. Um, and, of course, that's uh, a close association with devil mythology and other kind of so-called evil things. Uh, there we go. And that's the other thing that's spreading. You know, this is the... But this is what witches do uh, with their time. Uh, anyway, during part three, I'll also chat about how this is still fitting uh, and uh, going on and still happening in the world today. But also, hopefully, on part three, I'll demonstrate and inspire how women know how to work around this nonsense to create a culture of much more equality and inclusion for all human beings. And, of course, it's lovely to get together. I show those pictures of... Uh, dancing and to get together. Why not? But it's the fact that that's the imagery of what witchery is about. That's what I'm going to give an origin. You know, I think that's absolutely lovely for people to get together in celebration like that. So I'm not really knocking it. Anyway, so this is part one, and I'm going to be talking about the origins of uh, witches, cauldrons, and ale. And some archaeologists have entered into researching into the origins of history of fermentation and brewing. And uh, their main discovery has been evidence of the craft of brewing being originally created and managed by women. And uh, this is a very old, you know, that's actually a woman that's been carved out there, very old carving of this very practice. And without the archaeologist's scientific evidence, this makes a lot of sense. If the, To me, if they didn't come up with the science with their findings, um, <clears throat> makes a lot of sense to me because gender roles are very much in taboo in many countries today. You know, they're still gender roles are still greatly aligned, I think, by many cultures and many in many countries. But um, 
though this is breaking down in several cultures, especially in the West, or what we call uh, the first world, I suppose, and uh, it's even got to the point of saying there are no genders uh, as a simple response to the current 68 genders, I believe we're up to now, uh, as counted last year, and that's still growing. Now, in ancient times, it seems everything, kitchen, garden, and barley farming, because barley was the most important cereal, it seemed, except later on in damper areas where oats took over. But it seems, so say kitchen, garden, and barley, seem to be very much the realm and domain of women. And it seems that men, at least all humans with penises talking about genders, let's just say the penis people, were mainly out on the hunt and helping attend to animals, or they were involved in the construction and repair of their family homes. Now, in short, with most tribes, it seemed to be the women who mainly grew and foraged ingredients. And these natural and growing ingredients, these natural ingredients that they grew were not only for preparing and serving as food, but they were ingredients that were used for fermentation and for brewing of drinks and for food too. Now, one example of where archaeologists have found evidence of brewing is from 2000 BC in an area that we now know as Iran, which is actually an, it's a more ancient name anyway. And within those ancient scripts, mainly on stone, of course, there's descriptions of the role of women that's translated out as being called an alewife. So I'm not coming up with a fairly new phrase. This is an ancient phrase uh, from at least 2,000 years ago of the alewife. Now, it's best known, uh, the alewife is probably best known within an ancient scribed epic of uh, Gil uh, Gilgamesh. And that's one of the oldest tests known to be scribed by a human. Uh, so uh, let's see if I got I got something of this. Um, there we go. That's uh, that's the epic of Gilgamesh. A sampling of it on the stone there, and uh, I think this is another one that's been preserved. I think they're in museums in Iran, in Tehran still. And on this journey that Gilgamesh uh, did, he spent quite a bit of time with an alewife, wife, and uh, the imagery. Uh, do forgive me for this, but this is part of uh, in the collection. Uh, apparently, that was some of the time he spent with the alewife. But there we go uh, with that one. Uh, so what is an alewife? What is this? And it, it goes back over 2,000 years at least uh, in Iran. Who was she? What did she do? And um, why do we refer to her as being an alewife? Now, if you're not aware of the tradition of the alewife, I think you'll be fascinated by this. And especially this week and the next edition of Witches, Cauldrons and Ales uh, that I'm doing on through Nature Folklore. Now, through this alewife tradition, eventually we do enter into the cruel and dark history of women. Something like this, which is perhaps you're more familiar with when we talk of women. But I hope this conclusion of this series during part three will be in, uh, showing you a more enlightened inspiration uh, of women. Um, I think that's right. I got the wrong one up there. No, the, the right, that picture I wanted hasn't come up. Never mind. Um, but let's set the scene from ancient times. And that, is, that was one of the ancient times scenes there. Now, for thousands of years among human existence, there has been, a, as you can imagine the way people behave today, there's been a huge unfillable demand for Alcoholic beverages, and that was the, that's what that picture is. There you go. There's a man souping up his alcoholic beverages, doing it in a very peculiar way, but I'm going to talk a bit about that shortly. But humans feel urged to consume this fermented brewed stuff. Now, during ancient times until a few hundred years ago, uh, here's an ancient brewer as well, um, the making, trade, and supply of most alcoholic bevies was all done by women. And most of their customers were men. Now, going back to the earliest ancient days of women and brewing, this may have started up during 
as I showed uh, the inscription from Mesopotamia, from Iran, uh, but certainly started off uh, perhaps a wider culture across Persia and then into the, the Assyrian cultures. And with the uh, Gilgamesh saga being one reference of this, I also suspect that women's brewing beer and becoming alewives was very abundant across the whole ancient Mesopotamia. So uh, there's another inscription from that. And especially, as I say, from what we know as Iran today. Now, I'll speculate on the origin and changing roles of alewives shortly. But to continue the flow and changes of their culture and traditions from Iran, there seems to have been a long-standing culture of alewives, as I say, through ancient Persia. And they spread westwards through what we know as Europe today and probably followed the culture paths of Balkan to the Baltic, uh, also along the Danube, as I mentioned, through the crumb stories after the first harvest, and also along the Silk Road trade route. But I'm not aware of this happening actually in China itself. I Maybe I need to do more research on that, but certainly from the middle of the Silk Road going westwards, there's a lot of tales of the alewives on that, the culture. Now, another discovery is that the ales made by these ancient women were not like the filtered and cold ales that served in bars today. Um, though what was served was a ferment, it was a brew, it was more the consistency of perhaps baby food, something like groats, or perhaps more like the smoothies that seem to be getting thicker these days and when we get smoothies, we regard them as a healthy superfood. Now, ferments such as ginger, turmeric, cabbage, apple, and more recently seaweeds, they're all being added to smoothies, aren't they? Uh, probably the smoothies you enjoy. They have these fermented additions. And we believe, and it does, it makes them more nutritious, makes them healthier, and perhaps makes them more of a tonic. Now, I gather there's some archaeological evidence, as I say, as we've noticed with the pictures I've shown, they seem to have these straws drinking the ale out there with these sort of long, wide kind of bamboo straws. Now, the alcoholic content of these brews, it was only between 1% and 3%, so the archaeologists' discovery tell us. And I believe this is still with, you know, one to three percent. I believe it's still within the legal limits of alcohol drinking that's allowed for children. Um, if it's under between one and three percent, then children under 18, they can legally drink it. But even so, the ancient men, they still regarded these alehouses, the ale, the ale wives in the alehouses, their brews, their potions as being a remarkable tonic. Probably more due to the ingredients, like what I mentioned, that goes into your modern smoothie uh, today, with the because there's raw ingredients, there's fermented ingredients, and there's the brewed, uh, malted barley, malted seeds, and um, plus the men welcome the extra female company for the comfort, as men do, of course. Now along the Silk Road route. Apples would have been an important ingredient within these brews because the Silk Road was the origin of many of the apple species that we enjoy today. There's a wonderful story about the Silk Road and apples and the species. Uh, I won't be covering that today. I've missed out doing that this year. But, of course, those brews along the Silk Road could have been the origin of cider oil in the USA, you know, it was hard cider. Now, after thousands of years of ancient women and culture, this uh, of brewing, this seems to have become rocked a bit by the creation and the very arrival of the very patriarchal Roman Empire and their cultural ways of society, which went more patriarchal. And during the rise of the Roman Empire, there seemed to be a rise in a new culture of male brewers. And this was uh, in Egypt. Um, and uh, this is a remnant uh, from a, a kind of brewery in Egypt uh, in ancient times. It's reckoned to have been uh, a male. Anyway, because there's several historians have actually been lecturing that uh, brewing and bread making actually all commenced in Europe. Are not earlier like I've been seeing in ancient Persia and Mesopotamia. And uh, 
here's uh, yeah, brewing in Egypt. There's a lovely image of brewing in Egypt there. <laughs> but despite this, I firmly believe, and there's an Egyptian brewery there as well. And despite this, I firmly believe that women were very much the original alchemists and guardians of um, all things that are yeast, fermentation, brewing, and distilling. That was very much originated. These are the main origins of being in the realm of women. And despite the intense Roman influence history that tried to rewrite and change the whole gender origins of brewers and brewing, so it's a men's industry, <laughs> uh, uh, which also accelerated during the spreading of the Christian faith culture as well, uh, women still continue to be the primary producers of ale all the way from the Balkans to the Baltic and within the lands each side of the Danube. Now, women also managed to sustain the monopoly of production of brewing within the cultures of Saxons, Angles, Danes, and the various Norse people, even what the Vikings trained it as far as brewing, that was still produced by the women. And the women within those cultures, they were very highly revered. It wasn't like the Romans let the men take over. The Norse really re revered the women. They were almost like goddesses, almost like beer goddesses, something like that. Uh, there seemed to be absolutely a no attempt by the males in the Norse regions, within the Germanic and Norse regions, to actually take over the brewing realm. So the Germanic, Viking, and Norse men, they just love the presence of that alewives, alewives culture. Now, the men of those northern tribes, as I say, they highly respected the brewing women, goddesses, bring the goddess back up again. Uh, and this is right through Viking Scandinavia. Anyway, I've blabbed a bit for that before we go to the next bit. Let's see what your... Uh, responding to this, there's Terry Slack Hardwick's here. Lovely, love the visuals, but must uh, go off. We'll catch later, unfortunately. Uh, yes, I've been reading that. Always hope all comes well of this, uh, Terry. Terry, uh, very, uh, it's a very stressful time for you. Thank you for taking the time for actually uh, catching up a bit of this. But uh, his prayers and blessings that all will be well for you. And uh, Sherry says, is this time permanently? No, Sherry, the four o'clock time when I did the poll, I asked people what time they liked and what was popular. Two o'clock, nobody liked that. Nobody came up in the poll saying keep it to two o'clock. So that was the least popular. But any time between four and eight seemed to be very popular time. So four o'clock is the time I'm trying to maintain. But I went to this workshop, as I say, the not workshop, and uh, I left there uh, coming up for 4.30, dash back home, switched everything on, hoped everything worked, and have the show for 5 o'clock. So it was just 5 o'clock so that I could get to a workshop. And this is what happens on Sundays, especially after COVID. There's more and more workshops. In fact, each Sunday, there's so many things on every Sunday. Today was quite a choice for me to do. Was I going to go to an Apple Festival? Was I going to go to this? You know, there's a whole list of things on on a Sunday. And I'm not surprised that the live numbers uh, are down what they used to be because there's so much more on. Uh, people must almost like pull straws of a hat. What am I going to go to this Sunday? Um, but uh, it's not bad weather here for the Apple Festival as there is the Apple Fest in Clonmel in Tipperary. That's a huge event. And they've got glorious weather there, I think. And then uh, the Organic Centre in, um, uh, in North Leitrim. Uh, they got the day there. I almost went to there. But that, no, I'll be back to four o'clock um, most Sundays after that. I think we've got you uh, caught up there. So let's catch up with some. Now, what motivated ancient men? What, what motivated them anyway to? turn their hand to brewing right in ancient times. And now, surprisingly, it seemed to be an ancient need to bring about some kind of sanitation of water and to create a safe drink and a safe food for the community and, well, especially the families. Now, we would think that in ancient times there'd be a lot more pure, safe water in that time, because there's a less of a population, they're not dealing with chemicals like we are now. Uh, so I think it's assumed that um, 
the water would have been okay, but apparently no, it was not. Uh, there were there were still so the archaeologists and anthropologists tell us there were still harmful bacteria runoff from the new organized farming, the settled farming, and also from human excrements too, which I kind of mm, I'm not sure about that one. Uh, it seems strange to think of human excrements being a problem back then. Uh, because today it's understandable with the poisons we consume, but in ancient times, this idea seems strange. Now, someone told me actually this week of a North American native indigenous story that the, the creator is now confused uh, of uh, all our human shite disappearing down one big hole after it's been flushed. Now, all of this waste of human excrement going down this big hole was not only starving the trees, but actually amplifying our own health challenges. Now, if we went back to shiting our excrement and peeing as well at the base of trees, uh, especially our favorite tree, that tree will be able to analyze how our health is. And the spirits of the trees, which is our ancestors living in the water that's in the sap of the tree that's been raised up, that would guide us to the remedies of what's going on. So that's going, you go to the tree, have a poop, and a pee, and that's your health checkup. The spirit of the tree is then advising you what to do next. But, of course, the creator's confused because that's not happening anymore. And according to this indigenous story, that's why animals look healthier than us today. Anyway, this ancient concern for water uh, in, and the state of water was said to be the motivation for brewing. Now, to me, this inspires a less talked about use of holy wells. And uh, you might have caught up with me that on Thursday, I now do a shorter broadcast on holy wells revival. And this includes the sacred spring wells. And these in the ancient times would have been a very important source of ale water too. And also for me, this adds an inspired ins interpretation of the mystery of the Bolon stones, if I can find a Bolon stone. This uh, is now on a concrete pedestal, but this was when it was actually in position. This is at Lazia's well outside of Kiju. I wish they'd kept it there. Anyway, uh, I think the brewing adds a bit of interpretation because that's a mystery. What's it doing there? That's a stream coming out of the base of the well. The, the water is springing up from deep down in the rocks, going into the well, and then it goes out through the channel, and there's this bollowing stone. Now, these bollowing stones, they might have been used for pair, pairing plant ingredients. This is a lovely one uh, from near Monastraden. Uh, this is um, a tractor's well in a moment. It's taking its time. No, it's not coming up. Yeah, there we go. And that's the sword dragon's head in the tract as well. Well, what looks like an eye there is where you actually put in a uh, stone and, uh, for the grinding. And here they are. This is a tract as well as well. Whole selection of stones, but today we call them cursing stones because a more modern from medieval times ritual is to actually put them into the hole, this one or this one, and turn them and... Uh, for a, a prayer, you turn, uh, uh, there we go. Uh, they said you turn clockwise, just like the people going clockwise with their Our Fathers and Hail Marys. But uh, typical medieval, if you want to curse someone, <laughs> someone who's very sinful, uh, then you go anti-clockwise as well. Now, some people believe these fallen stones are used for crushing bones, for powder as well. And... Uh, Maybe for snorting, like uh, snorting your ancestors, like what Keith Richards is said to have done with his father. Now, that would have been an interesting exclusive industry, wouldn't it? Of, uh, if custom ales were made by alewives uh, by crushed bones. Anyway, I got, I'd like to talk a few minutes going on from Bolling Stones about the ancient full of flower sites. Uh, here's what I'm talking about. That's I don't know if you're familiar with these, but uh, they got the well there. See that concrete box there? That's the thing I'm going to be talking about. And I'm always intrigued by these uh, full of flower sites because uh, they're interpreted in many ways. There we go. We, we've got some labeling there. There you've got the well, you've got the hearth, and you've got the trough of water. 
And uh, the full, uh, the actual word full is describing the heat, heating up of the water, a bit like a bubbling cauldron. Though these are square, they're not the square. But the idea is you've got to get these bubbled up. And uh, it's said that people heated up stones and threw hot stones in there. I'm not sure about that one because it seems to be a waste of energy. If you've got the fire and uh, you're cooking up food, why can't you just barbecue the thing on the fire instead of having this two-step process? Anyway, I was saying the Fulx describes the heat on the water somehow like a bubbling cauldron. And the flower or fiach being capturing of something from the wild. A uh, fierce in later translation is is deer because deer being a wild animal so that's a sort of cross translation of that word later on but let's think of fear of fla as being capturing something from the wild um and there's some assumption that these pits here they are for boiling up deer you know you catch the deer you throw it into the water or you heat up the water with your hot stones first, throw the deer in or some other meat. But for many reasons, that just doesn't make sense to me. Now, from autumn, from about now, from a bit later than now, there's actually an increase in wild yeast um, after the fruit harvest and after the tree sap emissions. There's a lot of stuff in the atmosphere that causes wild yeast to form in the atmosphere. Now, this wild yeast can be collected and used as a sourdough starter. It takes quite a bit of skill. But the, a lot of the ancients knew the skill of how to collect this wild yeast and make starters, not only for sourdough bread making, but also for ale brewing. And that's how the ancients became familiar with yeast. But it needs top brewing skills in order to prevent this wild yeast from getting contaminated. Now, one thing that's for sure is wild yeast beer or ale, like wild yeast sourdough bread, is probiotic, very friendly on the gut, uh, which unfortunately modern ales are not very friendly on the gut. So that's one big difference that this brewing, not only for helping with water, but helping with gut health as well. So the ancient ales could and did provide nutrition and do the body good for some, just like the old Guinness ads here, if you remember that ad. There you go. Does Guinness do the same as the ancient ales? There's a thing to question. <laughs> now, more important, ancient uh, ale being a drink that's safer than water at that time, as I say. So I'm going to go back to the fia, uh, fla, and it's more story translation you know uh, going talking about meaning of the wild does this mean that, you know was is there another translation does this mean the collection of wild yeast put full of flour together and we possibly have an interpretation that seems to be the bubbling pit that collects the wild yeast that is a very good interpretation of that uh, because fermentation does increase bubbling. So maybe there's no fire involved here, that the collection of wild yeast was skillfully done, and through that, maybe a bit of warming up. But I think what was going on here, and to, next week I'll be talking about the kind of shelters uh, that were put over the cauldrons, over the fire areas. Was there a shelter here? Or was it in the open? Probably in the open to collect the wild yeast. But somehow, to me, this is illustrating one example of the fermentation process of the ancient people. And this is something that may have been learned by the cultures over here that somehow had traveled over from the Middle East and through Europe and came to here. Maybe it was you. They were used for cooking up meat. Maybe the culture of the fermentation culture, especially in early medieval times, disappeared out of these pits. And people thought, ah, this is great. We can do some cooking here. Maybe that went on. Things do change. Ancient sites do have a change of use over time. So if you're going back to six to 9,000 years of this process of brewing, take another 1,000, 2,000 years forward, you're going to have a change of use. I often give the example of the 19th century churches the Church of Ireland churches that were built. Look how many of them become restaurants. 
change of use. So why not change of use for these ancient sites? But anyway, I'm going to focus on the idea of the bubbling pit that collects wild geese, the full of flower. And I think that fits quite well into the naming and the interpretation. Uh, maybe the full of flower was uh, managed by the pointy hat brewer woman in the uh, that's going to be represented in Hale Housewives next week. She hasn't got a pointy hat, but that's the sort of women, uh, woman image that we might imagine in that situation. And such a woman, she would be seen in the market with a pointy hat, and she would lead customers uh, to this, which is her broomstick shed. Uh, was that over a fuller flower? Look at the smoke coming out of that. She's led this man who's after his brew, uh, and leading him into the shed to purchase the brews and maybe she'll serve them to him. But that's the signal that that broom is a brew is ready and she'll be wearing a pointy hat in the market uh, as a sort of signal to the lads, follow me, like almost like a pipe piper and come and have your brew. Now, it's uh, full of flower story or similar. It demonstrates to me how these alehouse wives, especially the more ancient ones, had a very vital role in keeping the local communities healthy and nourished, especially their gut health. Rather, there's, you know, this I make jokes about this. It's not really about luring men to get drunk and lusty and parting with their assets. Uh, it was a healthy enterprise. But, of course, the other stuff went on as well, uh, thanks to the men, I suppose. Anyway, I'm going to see what you're saying at the moment, uh, what I'm waffling about. Ah, your crazy uncle comes in through the YouTube. Uh, also not consuming alcohol, but smoking herbs, open fire with healthy properties of smoke. But uh, moms don't use enough smoke. And I started with the wood stove today. And there's various things I've actually heard around that one, um, especially when I lived in the USA, especially when I went to things like the Hiawatha Festival in uh, the upper Michigan. Um, we talked about this, you know, why is it? Why is it the indigenous people in North America, they really have a problem with alcohol, but the, uh, us white guys and so forth, not me today, but, you know, white guys will be glugging it back and they can get up and they're fine the next morning. That doesn't happen. Uh, some, obviously, that's a problem, huge problem with the indigenous. But they'll smoke, 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 smoke. White guy smokes, what happens? Lung cancer, bronchitis, boom, they're gone. Interesting. Why is it that the smoke is a poison to us who've traveled, say, from the Middle East through to Europe and, and uh, in sort of well, Caucasian, but the other load uh, tribes that come from the East, to them, it's the alcohol and the brewing that could be a problem, but it's the smoke as a therapy. Interesting that you bring that up. Uh, just reminded me of uh, just that discussions we had in the North America. No running water through the house which was more healthy. Yeah, that's the purpose of the wells too. Uh, I talk, that's why I'm doing the Holy Wells revival on Thursday to encourage respect for that water uh, that's collected and let's unplug some of these wells. Thanks very much there, crazy uncle. I'm glad you're on board and coming up with these lovely comments. And you're from Santa Fe. There we go. Growing the gardens with a closed loop compost that we poop, uh, compost poop that we do ourselves and enjoying an apple, living the life. That really is living the life. Uh, I love it. Thanks for those comments. Fantastic. Um, anyway, so what do we define as witchery today? I, let's get to some photographs of that. Witchery today, something like this. What do we define here? Um, let's, let's kind of get the comments down so you can see the whole picture. Uh, lovely comments that they are. Um, so what do we define as witchery? Now, with the word uh, witches in today's folklore, uh, you may wonder why I'm sticking to this Ale Housewives stuff for so long, why I'm on chatting away about Ale Housewives. Get on with the witches! I believe that today we carry a strange but gothic romantic stereotyped in stop interpretation of who or what a witch is. And I feel that seems to have been molded further by the popularist uh, social media interpretations through social media groups over the past 15 years. I've noticed, I, I don't know how many of you noticed, but the interpretation of witchery 
over the last 15 years have changed so much to say what it was in the uh, 70s, in the kind of cultish 70s, and very much um, what I was brought up with in the 50s, which was still a bit of an offshoot and a bit of a revival of the 19th century Celtic revival. So uh, just me looking back at the witchery interpretations in the 50s, 70s, and now they're all very different. Now, I do agree that through the common perception of witches, it's very different to what I've been presenting so far, isn't it? Now, the modern interpretation of witchery may seem more helpful to justify our modern day herbal interests. And this is what a lot of herbalists, women herbalists, uh, with the way that they do this, because they're very much trying to be quite off the grid as well. And uh, so the modern interpretation goes along, I think, with modern herbalism. Nothing wrong uh, with that at all. It's what, you know, we've adjusted for today. Uh, so something like this might be going on uh, today, maybe. But perhaps the modern interpretation is then much more fun and much more palatable. They're inferring to the potential harsh lives of these ale house wives. But as I'll be talking about this next week, they became far from harsh lives. It's quite an adventure of change through the medieval years. But these ale house wives, women, they do, had to have a heritage of what we now refer to as herbalists before they could become successful brewers. Now, herbalist, think about it, is, you know, go to a herbalist. They're going to be a very limited wisdom and practice if they don't have such skills as drying, fermentation, distilling, malting, concentration, concentrating, I should say, reducing, blending, and storing. Herbalist has really got to have all those skills. And so does a, a brewer. So does an ale housewife. So look closely at the skills of herbalists, brewers, distillers, and food processors. And really, their skill base is very much the same. I'll repeat that again. The skills of herbalists, brewers, distillers, and food processors. Because I was doing herbalism stuff passed down from the family. I went off to be a food scientist. It was all the same realm, all very similar. Now, if you think about it, how many herbalists watching this make herbal tinctures using alcohol? Big question is, how many of those herbalists actually distill their own alcohol from brews that they create? To me, this is a massive clue to the origin of these women's crafts. Now, the other thing we focus on when we think of witches are those cruel years, of course, of the burning at the stake. I'll keep this fairly brief. <laughs> That's one way of explaining it anyway. And we may think this happened uh, just because they were herbalists. But there was no alternative farmer industry in those days. So how could there be a distinction? Ah, oh, the herbalists must be witches. We're supporting the farmers. No farm, farmer with a pH. No, that wasn't the case because those farmer in there were alchemists, of course, but the farmer industries weren't actually happening. So the distinction between the two just wasn't there. So during part three, actually, I'm going to explore that cruel oncoming age that manifested into this cruel infliction onto women. And it's so relevant to the recent world news that we're getting these days too. But I feel there are some potency clues within that age that ancient age of the ill wives, of how women still today can strike back with their cultures and help us to return the balance. Now, to recap a bit, uh, brewing was a realm that belonged to women since very ancient times. If I can get to a picture that relates to that. There we go. Uh, there's, some, there's a brewing picture. That's like some of the stuff we messed about with today. And bread was too. Uh, anything related to yeast was the realm of the women. Now, in many cultures, the growing of the cereals and the managing of cereals to create bread and ales, and similar for some fruit too, was also in the domain realm of women. And the picture's not coming up. There we go. That's a sort of lovely old and printed example. But unfortunately, women engaged in farming and kitchen tasks they were largely enslaved into that through male 
I suppose you'd say landowners at the time. Now, it seemed that only women that braved into entering the tradition of being alewives ended up with some better freedom than those enslaved to the land. So instead of being enslaved by men, they became alehouse wives. They kind of broke away and they actually ruled the roost. They actually ruled that realm uh, and they had perhaps even enslaved the men because they were the suppliers of their essential ale. And even, of course, the stray sex along the way, maybe, uh, if their ale had not killed them off first, of course. Um, but as I said, brewing became a woman's realm due to their inherited remarkable kitchen skills that successfully included brewing, uh, fermentation, distilling all this that was essentially required. So perhaps the standout skill of the alehouse brewing women was the management and magic of the black cauldron. And I did have a cauldron here. Um, it was supposed to, there's a bad transition, but there we go. The management and magic of the huge black cauldron in the central fire. And that cauldron, it can make stews and porridges and fruit preserves, as well as work the mash being made for ale brewing. There's a barrel of mash there. And also mass-produce concoctions for health and healing. And so really, the description of a witch, I think, is simple, very simple. Using modern jargon, I suggest she's a cauldron engineer. That's what a witch is in modern language. She's a cauldron engineer. But that seems that uh, humans, they they do prefer the gothic and fearful drama, that, drama, don't they? Of stories of the Hubble, bubble, toil, trouble, spells, cats, broomsticks, the works of women at the cauldron. And uh, this is lovely. That's my daughter, actually. <laughs> Uh, no, she hasn't come from the cauldron. Uh, she actually worked with the lads um, that did uh, Lord of the Rings and uh, went on through The Hobbit um, uh, with Weta Studios uh, in in um, Wellington in New Zealand. And she got the uh, the lads there to make her up for a Halloween do uh, in the same way as if she was a character in Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit. There you go. Anyway, uh so I think um, it seems, as I say, I think humans prefer that sort of gothic approach rather than hear boring tales of making porridge and mash, like I've been saying today for the ale. Now, I've not really touched on the actual ale houses happening yet, and that's going to be the main feature. This is a more late medieval ale house. Look how sophisticated it become. I'm going to be talking about that next week. Uh, anyway, let's see what your comments are uh, for this so far. Crazy Uncle is coming up with some lovely comments again. I distilled my own sunflower grown here, same with hemp, dandelion root, nothing complex, but done with the sun cycle as a straight male. Uh, did you have any uh, women teacher there, or was that from YouTube? How did you learn that, Crazy Uncle? Tell me who actually inspired you and teach you, taught you these skills. Um, I'm going to be talking about this, how the men pick this up from the women next week. And the reasons that happen, there's going to be an important subject. So but I'm interested in your story for that. Uh, and he's saying he is not consuming alcohol, but smoking herbs over by here properties with smokes. Um, so then he asked, going back to the argument and the statement that I was saying uh, before, wasn't it? Right. Uh, these are the topics coming up in part two, of which is the nails and cauldrons. I'm going to talk about the ale housewife brooms. I'm going to talk much more detail about those, the broomsticks. I showed you that picture earlier. And what became of witches' brooms. We'll get on to that. Why and when the ale housewives wore pointy black hats. Um, that's not really a pointy one. But I'll talk about pointy ones. And now the Owl House wives' children, how they served in the ale houses, and how the ale house wives eventually became very wealthy, actually. And of course, as the ale house wives became wealthy, there were certain men who didn't like that happening. 
because brewing defined power. This was what was discovered. The brewers had a lot of power. And I'll talk about how the old housewives changed through the thousand years of medieval culture, uh, which includes the rise of the um, church guilds, the boys clubs type people. There you go. I think you've seen that in various history. Also the effects of feudalism on ale housewives that happened from the 12th century. Um, yeah, we got another comment come up. And now and there we go. Mix of going into ancestry and the internet. Without the internet, I would not have been here. Interesting. I think that goes back to what I was saying earlier that how this whole imagery and learning process and interpretation of the last 15 years is very, very different. Um, a lot of people were lured into sort of what was called as cults, which a cult is actually short for culture. In the 70s, unfortunately, a lot of these leaders, they were very expensive. It was almost a situation uh, with these cults that people were used to, if you go for an apprenticeship, if you go and do work, you do get paid a bit something uh, for that. But with these cults, you actually paid them to do the work for them. You were showing this stuff, you had to pay them. I suppose there's workshops still like that now but uh in the 50s when i started getting them through this you actually turned up at uh, things like what well, i did today uh some get-togethers and that's how you learn stuff as well from and it was what was actually passed down yeah the word books involved uh that's how the celtic romance started but certainly anything to do with the brewing distilling when i was young that was very much from the women's realm and interestingly me my uh grandmother and her two sisters, they actually ran a brewery. Uh, they were partners in a brewery. And uh, my father uh, had a situation. Um, it was after the Second World War. He was a doctor. I'm not going to go into the story, but things are broken down. He needed a job. He decided he didn't want to be a doctor uh, anymore, which was going against the family tradition of herbalism anyway. Uh, he wanted another career. And he had got fascinated by chemical engineering, uh, but he couldn't afford to go back to university. So he ended up working for his mother's and sister's brewery. And I used to go along there, and uh, it was fascinating seeing these men there. <laughs> they were kind of ruled by women. So I was brought up with, a, you know, in the environments uh, where brewing had been passed down through women, even in the 50s, and there were the men kind of associated uh, with that. And I, that's as much as I would say about that. But that's uh, where some of mine came from. Anyway, as I mentioned, keep this nature folklore show financially floats. Thanks to our subscribers. That's the main uh, link there. And I'll get the old uh, banner. If you don't like using the Patreon, you can always go through here as well. Uh, buy me a coffee. Thank you very much uh, for your support on that. Any euro, dollar, or pound a month, it helps keep this show afloat. And as I say, coming up on nature folklore sessions, we got um, 2nd of October, then it's part two, uh, where I'm going to go into the medieval momentum, uh, which is uh, uh, exciting stuff. And I'll be getting more into what you're more familiar with, maybe familiar with with uh, how you interpret witchery. So I think you'll find next week uh, a bit more something that you can perhaps relate to a bit more. Uh, but it was very much a means of survival as well. That's, a, a, I gather, a a printing from a medieval brewery as well. Also, don't forget, 7 p.m. this Thursday, Irish time, is our Holy Wells Revival edition. And I'm trying to keep that to 30 minutes uh, if I can. Uh, desperate thing to do. Uh, short subjects. And uh, I'm just going to through, go through a few books and their authors next uh, Thursday. And then the Thursday after is going to be Leitrim Wells. And the Thursday after that is going to be Dublin Wells. And so, um, what we got here as well, um, crazy uncle here. And in Flagstaff, Arizona, there's a winter sun. A great herbalist, Phyllis Hogan, which I somehow it rings a bell, was my teacher in college biology. Thank, you. really, uh, uh, thanks for your flow of comments uh, here today. It's been very interesting, lovely contribution of what's going on. I love that. Thanks very much for that. 
for those of you who are watching, excuse me, those of you watching this as an archive, which it looks like a lot of people will be, um, do uh, ask questions, make comments, and I do return to answer them from time to time. Click the subscribe button below as well. Uh, I think it's as much as I can offer for part one. I've gone over a bit more than I thought I would. I thought this would be a fairly short. Next week, medieval momentum. I think you'll find that exciting uh, because of the fact that I'm bringing up familiar stuff. Brooms, pointy hats, cats, stuff like that. And uh, But in the realm of the alehouse woman and how, as I say, brewing was power and how she wielded that power and how the men thought this was a challenge and what started to happen. That's part two next week. So I look forward to you joining me with that one. Uh, thanks very much. It's lovely to present this to you again. We'll get guests back on here with their ha Halloween and, well, I shouldn't say Halloween, their Sawan Savan poems and stories and experiences coming up as we get closer towards the end of October and the early November. So enjoy a safe week, uh, full of all that uh, wonder, brewing maybe, certainly there might be a well, uh, it's a good time for the brewing and distilling with the fruits, fermentation going on. I'm going to be making jam, I think, after this, uh, so they won't be involving any fermentations. Uh, let's see what we got here. Please let me know how to donate. Uh, thanks very much. Donate there. The two addresses go to patreon.com, Woodland Bard. Follow the instructions, Maureen. Or it depends what you want. Uh, Patreon do ask for PayPal. They work through PayPal. Or you can go to buymeacoffee.com, Nature Folklore, which is there. Uh, give those a whirl. And... Um, and follow the instructions. And uh, if you, if it's a problem, message me and I'll guide you through that. So thanks very much, Maureen, uh, for that. Uh, so I think that's it. I think that's all we got uh, here. Uh, what have I got? I guess get to the uh, final couple of images here. I think that's all I've got. So as I say, I've got a different layout here today. And I jumped into, I think it operated okay. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks so much and uh, have a safe week. As I say, this is like the Irish goodbye, isn't it? So bye bye. See you on Thursday or maybe next Sunday as well. Bye. And I don't have the goodbye uh, logo up. So I would say goodbye again and then the broadcast. Thank you so much. That's not working either. <laughs> oh, uh, glitches at the end. There we go. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>